Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we appreciate everyone joining us today. I'm Lindley Wall. I'm one of the hand surgeons at Washington University in the orthopedic department. And I'm here today with my partner, David Brogan. Um, we're gonna talk about hand numbness and tingling. Um, I am a hand surgeon as are my partners and um, I treat a lot of normal and common hand conditions. I also have an interest in pediatric upper extremity and also spasticity. So people with stroke and um, cerebral palsy. Good afternoon, uh, I'm David Brogan. I'm also one of the orthopedic uh, hand and microsurgeons at Washington University. Uh, we all treat a variety of common hand conditions such as carpal and cubital tunnel syndrome. And I have a particular interest in microsurgery and complex nerve injuries, as well as uh, complex uh, limb reconstruction. So we might as well just jump right into it. So uh, Lindley, when uh, you have a patient that comes into your office and says, you know, my hands have been numb and tingling and maybe they're waking me up at night. Uh, what are the things that come to mind? What do you, what do you typically think about? Yeah, you know, it's one of those uh, conditions a lot of people hear about, um, but carpal tunnel really is the first thing that jumps to my mind. Um, it is commonly seen. It can affect um, usually people kind of middle age and older. I do sometimes see it in teenagers. It presents a little bit differently. Um, but people come in, they talk about their fingers feeling numb. Usually it's the thumb, index, and middle finger. Um, so these three, sometimes part of the ring finger that feels numb, it can come and go. Um, sometimes over time, it, it's numb for a long time. Um, some people also complain that they have weakness in their hand, they have problem grasping things. The numbness kind of comes about um, feeling like trying to pick up objects. It's kind of hard. They'll feel like they start dropping objects. Um, they also have pain, pain in the wrist. A lot of complaints, what brings people in a lot of times is they can't sleep at night. So they're trying to sleep, they're having to shake their hand to try to get it to wake up. Um, and that's really irritating. And over time, um, the numbness can be more constant and really uncomfortable. So um, that's usually their complaints. Um, David, I know you see a lot of these too. Where do you go from there um, when you're talking about, you know, looking at them and examining? How do you move forward in the office? Yeah, I think uh, the history is a big component of it. Uh, a lot of times, just by talking to somebody, you can get a pretty good sense of whether or not their symptoms fit with carpal tunnel. I think all of the things that you described are very common and very typical for that diagnosis. People talk about waking up at night, pain waking them up at night. They have to kind of shake their hands out or sometimes straighten their arm out. Um, and uh, certain positions make it better or worse. Yeah. A lot of times folks talk about uh, driving a car or any sort of vibration will sometimes make it worse. Uh, golf clubs or gripping, uh, even sometimes talking on the phone can be a number of different things. And uh, typing, typing right. really, a lot of people have it with typing, yeah. One sure, day. any sort of activity that kind of increases their hands uh, motion and, and increases the pressure around their wrist can certainly uh, provoke it, uh, at least in my experience. In terms of where do you go, yeah, getting a good history uh, is, is critical. And then the way that uh, at least I started is just with a pretty simple physical examination. So trying to figure out uh, which fingers are involved, as you pointed out, it's usually more on the kind of thumb side of the hand, mm -hmm. uh, less common for the pinky to be involved. That's, that's kind of a different thing that we'll talk about in a bit probably. Um, and then some of the simple tests that we typically do is have people kind of uh, one you can do at home push your, the back of your hands together and sit there and hold that for about yeah. 20 to 30 seconds. Uh, and, and what you're trying to do there is you're trying to put pressure on that nerve kind of right here at the wrist, kind of decreasing the space for that nerve to hopefully elicit some of those symptoms that people are complaining about. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Yeah, because, you know, maybe we should step back and talk about kind of what is carpal tunnel. So yeah. what's, uh, what's involved and what's the nerve involved? What do you tell patients about yeah. that? Yeah, you know, I think the first thing to say is, you know, the carpal tunnel itself is actually this space right here at the wrist. Um, how I kind of think about it, and I try to provide a picture, I'm a very visual person, is that there's bone kind of all the way around. You've got the little bones in the wrist here, and they have bones all the way around to the front. And then from this side to here, there's actually a ligament that goes right across, and it creates a canal. It creates that carpal tunnel, um, and the tunnel is a tight structure, so bone all the way, ligament on the top. The tendons that bend the fingers go within that tunnel and then you've got the nerve. Um, and if you imagine you have a confined space, if for some reason you have a little bit of swelling from overuse or something, you then the nerve is what kind of kicks off and becomes symptomatic. Um, usually how I think about it is that the nerve's not getting enough blood flow and as a result it becomes a little irritated. It doesn't send the signal from the brain 
to the hand and then from the fingertips back to the brain. So you're kind of slowing the nerve right here at this area. Um, and so that's kind of how I think about it. So when you were doing putting, you put your wrist down, you're really compressing that nerve. Another way is putting some pressure. I like to do that, hold pressure over the nerve. It can sometimes kick off the feeling. Or then, you know, just tapping on it can kind of irritate the fingers too. Absolutely. Yeah, I think anything that kind of provokes it in terms of increasing the pressure at that spot, we have all sorts of fancy names for those exams, but they don't really matter. It's just the fact that you're putting pressure on the nerve and you're trying to provoke what it is that is causing that pain for folks. And that making that correlation between uh, is it when I do this, does that kind of cause those symptoms that bother you on a regular basis is really important because sometimes people can still have some irritation from doing this, but they say, no, that's really different. It's not, that's not at all what it is that, that bothers me, but it's when kind of the, I tell folks it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, you know, if, if that's what it is, then that seems to be really suggestive of that. And that makes sense too with when we sleep at night, you know, we all kind of tend to uh, bend our wrist. And, yeah. Or, or even like this way, sleeping. Like yeah, either way. Either way, exactly. Yeah. It puts more yeah. pressure on for sure. So what are your sort of first steps when you meet someone with this? What do you, um, I, you know, I like to recommend brace wear. I think that we don't know how we sleep. Um, and I think that can be helpful. Do you, do you agree? Do you recommend that? For sure. I think that's what, uh, when you look at the evidence and what all of our guidelines suggest is that everybody should or at least we try and give most people a chance at uh, trying just wrist splints. And so and there's nothing fancy. People ask, you know, do I have the right one? Is it, which one should I get? And I basically say, you know, they're all probably about the same. The key thing is that it's got some sort of support. So just kind of a strap around the wrist is not going to be enough or just a really soft one is probably not enough, but it's got to have some sort of firm support to kind of keep that wrist in a pretty neutral position to keep people from putting pressure on the wrist when they sleep at night. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I try and have them do that for a while. How long do you, if you try bracing, how long do you make them do it? Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Um, I, I usually recommend if they've never tried it to try it at least for about a month or so. Um, and then if they're seeing no improvement, we reassess. But if they start to see some gradual improvement, uh, I think it's worth continuing. I think sometimes a part of it is if my hope is that wearing a brace at night helps the daytime symptoms also. Um, not just helping people sleep. And so if we can make the nerve happier at night, typically it can help during the day. Um, so how about, is that about what you think or, or do you have a different yeah, time frame? Absolutely, because the way I think about it is that we're just trying to make the nerve, we're trying to decrease swelling. We're trying to decrease that irritation around the nerve. And so it doesn't make sense to some folks when you talk about it, because they say, well, I, I really, it bothered me during the day and occasionally at night, but why, why are you telling me to wear it at night? Right. And, you know, the, the simple answer is that it's usually easier for people to tolerate wearing braces at night and they're not as cognizant of their position of their wrist. And during the day, sometimes they can guard against doing things that make things worse. And if you give the nerve kind of a break during the night, it'll make it just calmer and happier. And a lot of patients, not a lot, but at least some proportion of patients, if, um, if they're happy with the brace and it, it solves the problem, then we just say, that's it and, and use it for as long as you're okay with things. Yep. And that may be all that they need. Do you see that uh, sometimes? Yeah, absolutely. And I think people, if they get some relief and then if it goes away, I think they should keep their brace. You know, there could be times in the future where it may flare up. Um, I think another thing, uh, while I encourage the nighttime wear, if there's certain activities during the day, like um, some, I've had some uh, truck drivers who get a lot of it, like you had said, with driving and they do prolonged driving. So I say, you know, wear it during the day. If there's a specific activity that makes it worse. I think it can be helpful to kind of use it as a tool, just try to make the nerve better. So absolutely. Um, do you do any testing besides your physical exam? I know people talk about nerve tests. I didn't know if you want to, what's your strategy for when you order those and why you like them? So if nobody's, if somebody comes in and they've never had any sort of um, therapy for this, then I will, or meaning any sort of treatment, then I'll, I'll try the splinting first, because if that solves it, then I don't think there's any point in getting a nerve test. Mm -hmm. uh, it's if we're not going to do anything else about it. Um, the nerve test is a uh, good and helpful uh, strategy to help confirm the diagnosis. And I tend to do that for anybody that I'm considering uh, further surgery or some sort of uh, intervention on. Um, but if, if we have not even tried a splint, then I, I wouldn't uh, begin with the nerve test. How about you? Yeah, I agree. I like to start with splints because I think sometimes it can calm it down enough. 
you know, I think there's a, a question about actually the role of physical therapy. Um, for me, that's not something I typically uh, order. I don't, I think most of it is calming down the inflammation. It's not usually stiffness um, causing the nerve to be irritated. So for me, therapy doesn't really have much of a role. I don't know how you feel about that. Agreed. And, and, you know, people have looked at this with different uh, studies and such mm -hmm. and found, as far as I know, not a real significant benefit to having therapy in the treatment of carpal tunnel. Although we get that question a lot. It's a good one because yeah. that's yeah. a common thing. We do use therapy for a lot of things in hand surgery and for treating people a lot of hand conditions. Yeah. But this doesn't really seem to be one that, that seems to respond to that as much. Yeah. Um, so if you, so Lindley, talk to me about the nerve test. So do you get them? And then, and if so, what, what should your patients expect uh, when you're, they're undergoing those tests? I like nerve tests. I think they help me to um, identify that this is the actual contribution of the pain. Um, it helps us, the nerve test, it's not done. We don't do our own. We have some of our partners do it. And what, um, how I can explain it is, um, we're trying to see how the nerve conducts its message across the wrist specifically, like how when the nerve signals come from the brain, how fast they can go. And if it's slowed, then we know it's not communicating very well. It gives me also a sense of severity. Um, uh, you know, if, you, if it's been compressed for a long time or if the nerve, it seems sicker than for other people, I guess is the way to think about it. It also helps us to kind of rule out other reasons for nerves to be irritated or cause finger numbness. So I use it, it a lot of times if, um, if I wanna see if there's some component of um, nerve compression up in the neck. Um, and then also if there's another nerve that could potentially be causing some of this numbness, I think it helps me to sort of delineate um, but I, I like to get it. It's a confirmatory test. There are people out there who have negative tests where the net tests are normal, but they still have symptoms. And that's a smaller category of people. And we can kind of talk about our approach to them. But um, the nerve test, I think it takes about 45 minutes. Um, it's tolerable. It's probably not something you want to do every day, <laughs> but it gives us good information. It lets us know sort of the health of the nerve. Sure. What about your thoughts? No, absolutely. I would agree with that. And in uh, and patients, uh, tolerate to different degrees. Most people find that it's it's not their favorite thing in the world, but they can deal with it, and, um, and it's not as bad as it may sound when you're kind of reading about it and, and things. The other thing they do hear a lot, which I really find valuable, is uh, we'll often get an ultrasound at the same time of, as the nerve conduction study, and that's just another way to look at the nerve. The nerve test itself uh, tells us how the nerve is functioning. The ultrasound tells us kind of what the nerve looks like, and the, the hopefully at some point, we may be able to uh, just rely more on the ultrasound and the nerve test because it's a little bit less invasive, but I don't think we're there yet. And I don't think that the ultrasound tells us enough about how badly injured the nerve is or how severe it is at yeah. this point, basically. But it's something else we may have done. Yeah, I think absolutely a lot of people would say the nerve study is sort of our gold standard. It's the best study we have right now to evaluate the nerve, but hopefully we can progress. Yeah. Um, and then I think kind of before we jump into surgery, we probably have to move a little faster here. Um, what is your thought about injections? I use them every once in a while. Who do you offer cortisone injections to for carpal tunnel? Right. Uh, probably a similar group uh, to what you alluded to. I don't use it for everybody. I think for folks where I'm not sure if it's uh, coming from the carpal tunnel or coming from somewhere else, it can help me uh, tease it out. If they respond well, I say, well, maybe we can give you hopefully the relief that you got from the injection. Uh, if they don't respond, then I'm a little bit uh, more hesitant to proceed with surgery or something like that. The other thing is for folks who can't have surgery for some reason. And so they either have some other medical problems or a common one that I'll use it for is uh, uh, women who are pregnant because we are trying to avoid surgery. Carpal tunnel seems to kind of flare up for some folks during pregnancy. And, yeah. um, and oftentimes it gets a little bit better after the baby's delivered. So if you can just kind of get them through um, then and injections are really a useful way to do that. So that's one of my kind of typical indications for injections. So how about you? Yeah, no, I think you hit on all the, uh, the particular people that I offer it to. I think that um, I also really like it, you know, for diagnosis in the people with the negative studies. So we, they have very classic symptoms. We get a nerve study and they're negative. I think I, I really like to do injections then because I think just like you said, it'll give us an idea if surgery will help. I'm not necessarily doing it as a cure for the carpal tunnel, but more as a diagnostic tool. And it can be very helpful. 
for sure. So, and yeah. and I would say that the kind of curing it and whatever else that usually surgery is the more definitive cure, but mm -hmm. I think there is some data and I've had some experiences where folks with more mild compression, the nerve is just a little unhappy and the swelling is not so bad, it's just a little inflamed that the injections probably, if it's going to be successful for anybody, it's going to be helpful for those folks usually in and, terms of curing it. Yeah, and I, and I also, to, just to kind of tag onto that, I agree. I think it's people who haven't had symptoms very long. Yeah. Um, I usually say I will offer it to people who've had symptoms for a couple months. Mm -hmm. um, so it hasn't been like three years, but a couple months, I think there's a chance it, it is it can cure. So, sure. yeah. Well, along those lines, say you have somebody come in and say, Doc, it's been, this has been going on for five years and they've been so numb and, and I can barely feel the cup of coffee in my hand anymore. Um, what is your next step? And uh, the, the nerve studies confirm they've got moderate to severe uh, carpal tunnel. What are you, what are you going to do? Yeah, no, I think surgery is probably, you know, our best, our next step for that. Um, and then I, I, when at that point I kind of talk about what surgery involves and I think that may be different practice to practice. Um, but for me, you know, I do like surgery as a, um, it's a very good surgery. I think that the two main risks of surgery are something that we all have to discuss with every patient. One of those is nerve injury, which is pretty rare, um, but it, it is there. Uh, and then also not fully releasing the nerve. So I always let people know that, you know, I try, those are my two goals, not to injure the nerve and also to do a full release. And I think that's everyone's goal when they do a carpal tunnel. Um, but just kind of the, my sort of brief um, explanation about how I do surgery is, we do it at our surgery center typically. People come in, they go home the same day. I offer usually two ways. You can either be completely awake for, awake for surgery and just get some numbing medicine. Incision is usually right here. It's about a centimeter and a half in length. Um, the other option is to get a little sedation so you can sleep uh, and then the surgery happens. I do a little numbing medicine, but you don't feel anything. You don't hear anything. Um, after that, what we do, the surgery takes about seven to 10 minutes. Um, we're very careful. We actually release a lot further than the incision, but it's under the skin. I don't use a, um, a little camera to do it. I usually just do it with an open procedure, but it's still a small incision. After surgery, people go home, they have an ACE wrap on from here to here. I only use two stitches typically. When they're at home, I let them take their dressing off about five days. And then at that point, I let them get their stitches wet. And then I take the stitches out at two weeks. At two weeks, I don't really um, limit people. I kind of use the words of one of my mentors that um, it will hurt you, but you won't hurt it. So they can increase activities as tolerated. Um, that soreness in the skin will be there for a while with direct pressure. But as you know, that gets better um, at, in different people at different speeds. But over time, you're not going to hurt it, but it'll, it'll improve. So... Perfect. Yeah, I, yeah, that's pretty similar to what I do as well. I think you hit everything on the head that uh, people ask about endoscopic carpal tunnel. Yeah. I don't do endoscopic. I, mm -hmm. I trained with some folks who did, and uh, I'm, and there are folks who can do that and, and like that. I I I think it's reliable and um, in my mind's a little bit safer just to open it up and do it the old-fashioned way. So that's my preference. But um, yeah, that's certainly another option for some folks as well. So. We got a uh, question about uh, does weight bearing through the hands during boot camp or training workouts uh, increase your risk of carpal tunnel? What do you think, Linda? Yeah, you know, I think that uh, repetitive trauma has a chance of increasing your risk. Um, I for sure know that people who use jackhammers will have an increased risk of carpal tunnel. I think it probably has to do more with um, um, consistency and longevity of that trauma to your palm. Um, you know, and I don't know if there's a threshold that we know, but I bet it's a little different in everyone. So potentially maybe, I don't know. What are your thoughts? No, I think you're right. I think, uh, it's probably, there are probably some folks who have, kind of have nerves at risk. And mm -hmm. so if the nerve is already a little unhappy, it's a little compressed, you may find that certain activities might eventually kind of send it over the edge. And so it may be that you attribute, you know, is this when it all started? It's, it's usually rare for any single activity, I think, to really cause it but it may be kind of the tipping point, uh, basically. Um, and then we got another question. Uh, wearing a brace at night helps, uh, according to the, this person. Uh, how do you differentiate numbness from carpal tunnel from circulatory issues or Raynaud's syndrome? So, oh, that's a great question. So Yeah, you wanna uh, go hmm? ahead. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it can be tricky because there can be, as 
as the question alludes to, uh, there's lots of different things that can kind of make nerves misbehave. And so um, the nerve being compressed, the carpal tunnel syndrome is, is one of them. And then circulatory issues, so when you're not getting enough blood flow to the fingers, if the nerves in the fingers themselves are not getting enough blood flow, then they don't like that. And so they'll also respond sometimes by kind of being numb and tingly. Other uh, illnesses and conditions like different uh, drugs and chemotherapy agents uh, all can kind of take hits on the nerve. Um, different systemic uh, diseases and conditions can cause the nerves to be unhappy and to lose some of their function. So it can be a bit difficult if there's uh, concern for some sort of uh, decreased circulation or not enough blood flow to the fingers, then there are some tests that we can do. Some simple tests in the office, just kind of even pushing on the blood vessels and different and seeing how the hand responds. And then there are some fancier tests that we can do, uh, which involves sometimes an ultrasound, sometimes it involves uh, something more invasive like an angiogram, which is kind of an x-ray to look at the blood vessels and such. Um, and that can be when I've got a high suspicion that somebody has something like uh, circulatory issues, that's one of the things that I'll, I'll do sometimes. Um, Renan's is a bit more characteristic in how it presents. And people often say, my fingers turn blue, especially when I'm getting stuff out of the freezer at the grocery store or on a cold day in the middle of January. Um, so there's some hints that kind of lead you more towards that and away from the carpal tunnel. But how about you, Lindy? Yeah, no, I think, and I think that question kind of leads, I think you answered it perfectly. Um, and I think that um, it kind of leads us to other things that could be, people think are carpal tunnel, but could be something else. And I think um, these are kind of, you know, sometimes it could be a circulatory problem that is causing some numbness potentially. I think um, peripheral, um, uh, like a neuropathy can also cause some numbness and tingling, but aren't necessarily coming from the, you know, the carpal tunnel, which would be the median nerve. So I think that's also a good time where the nerve study can help us figure that out a little bit. Um, there's other uh, conditions, you know, more cervical um, nerve compression, and then the, the ulnar nerve, which um, I don't know if we'll actually get to today, um, can cause more numbness, tingling in different fingers. So that kind of helps us pick out the distribution. Um, another thing to think about is, um, which I don't think we've mentioned is people who are inclined to get carpal tunnel. I think there's certain risk factors. I think this inflammation, there's some people who have more inflammation and people with diabetes, some thyroid problems, um, underlying arthritis, like uh, rheumatoid, they can be more like more likely to have it. And, you know, and also pregnancy, something that's a little bit more transient, but it makes your whole body swell. And that nerve just doesn't, some people doesn't have as much room to give. Um, also, one, one that I always don't, I try always to remember, people who've broken their wrist in the past. So you may have some deformity of this bone right here, the radius bone. And so it, it overall, the, the space that you have here, your, maybe your nerve can't accommodate as much swelling if there's less room because of a previous fracture. That's when I try to remember when I'm talking to people. So Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think anything that kind of tips the nerve and makes it unhappy is, uh, can contribute to that for sure. Absolutely. What are your thoughts on um, how, what people should expect on when their symptoms should be better or, or could they potentially have recurrence? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. So it's the thing that I always try and emphasize to patients before we even consider surgery is that the results of the surgery, it's pretty good at relieving pain. It's a very good surgery. It's very reliable. What's more difficult is trying to get back numbness that's been present or trying to get back normal sensation when you've had numbness for years. And the way I think about that is that if the nerve is being kind of choked and pressed and irritated for so long, eventually it's gonna start undergoing uh, scarring with inside the nerve itself. And once that scarring and those changes occur, we can't really fix that with surgery. All we're doing with the surgery is where I tell folks we're, you know, we come, we release that ligament, basically just cutting the ligament on top of the nerve. And I tell folks, it's like, you're unbuckling your belt after Thanksgiving dinner, just kind of breathe yeah. a little bit more easily, you know? And so the nerve likes that and it stops hurting you so badly at night. And that's pretty reliable to relieve. But uh, in far, as far as it's healing and uh, kind of being that normal sensation, the nerve has to heal itself from the inside. And that can take longer. It's easier if you're a 15 year old that's had symptoms mm -hmm. for about a week. Um, it's a lot harder if you're in your 80s and you've had this going uh, for 20 years. That nerve is just gonna be more damaged. And so it's- and I'll tell you, ages are getting younger to me every day. So, yeah. you know. <laughs> for sure. So, Absolutely. But the, the nerve recovery is definitely yeah. related age to related. age and other medical problems and things like yeah. that too. So 
it's, I think, frustrating at times for patients when we can't say, oh, yeah, you're going to have normal sensation after surgery. I, I think that um, that is difficult to predict. We have some sense of it, but it's, it's no, by no means a guarantee for sure. Yeah. You know, the one good thing I, that I, I feel like, and someone will prove me wrong one day, um, but that night pain, mm -hmm. the pain that wakes people up at night, not the numbness, but the pain typically that night after the surgery, people say that is gone. And so that is real relief and really nice. While the numbness may take some time that like the pain in the wrist and the hand gets better. Um, so that's, that's a good benefit. For yeah. sure. No, I, I think almost uniformly people, when you come back at two weeks uh, for their first post-op, they say, yeah, that that's gone. I'm sleeping better, which is nice. Yeah. Um, well, we've got look, to we do have this other question here. So yeah. how often do we find the pronator syndrome um, issues overlapping with carpal tunnel? <clears throat> what do you yeah. think? Yeah, I think it's something that's, um, it's probably there more often than we appreciate. And that sometimes it's one of these kind of uh, things that might be contributing. Um, occasionally we'll see it. I don't see it uh, all do that. Check, do you check it every time? I don't check it every time. Okay. So it might be one of those things where it's seen me and I've not yeah. seen it. Um, I've seen it occasionally. I've done a few pronator releases. Um, yeah. Usually I rely on my physical exam to help me. And then the nerve studies are also good for that. So if we see that there's something different not just at the carpal tunnel, but higher up. The nerve study can occasionally help with that, although pronator syndrome is famous for not necessarily showing up on nerve right. study. So how about you? Do you see a lot of pronator syndrome? Yeah, you know, I think I've taken a little bit of institutional experience with um, the pronator release. When I was training here, um, I, we won't get into those details of the length of time, but one of my older mentors who's not here anymore, um, he used to, there was a time period he did a lot of those. He released a lot of pronators with his carpal tunnels, and then he kind of stopped doing it. And so his experience, um, what it, it's set, it, I think it's that idea of, with nerve injury, you can have a double crush where if your nerve is compressed in one area, it's more likely to be irritated in another area. Um, and so by what, you know, while you may have carpal tunnel, if I put some pressure on your pronator, which is a little bit more up in the mid forearm, it could be irritated on exam. But when you release the carpal tunnel, typically some of that pronator improves. And right. so he kind of stopped doing both releases because people were still getting an improvement in both places from the carpal tunnel. Sure. So for me, I definitely have released pronators, absolutely. But I typically try to address the carpal tunnel, which is much more common. Right. Um, and like you said, I think the nerve studies can kind of help us look at that. But if they have very, very exquisite um, discomfort at the pronator, I think that's a different presentation. Um, they talk a little bit more about that aching uh, and I have done it. Um, I think also one thing a lot of people will talk, especially younger um, women and teenagers and in their 20s will have this wrist pain with carpal tunnel and it can radiate, but they have a little bit less classic symptoms. So I'm, I, I go a little slower with them, but I think that's it. Sorry, I just wanted to mention that's a different cohort of people, but. For, for sure. I think in, in theory, the carpal tunnel shouldn't radiate all that much up the form, but yeah. I, I've seen a lot of people who will describe the pain that kind of just shoots up. All the way that's up. Different than if it's kind of, we try to distinguish at least, they say, oh, it's pain that's coming down from my neck and into my arm. And that's probably more of, as you mentioned, the cervical radiculopathy, which is fancy way of saying you have a pinched nerve in your neck, right? Yes, and so exactly. um, those patients can also have stuff where it's, it's angry up here, and it's angry down here, and then they kind of play off of each other. And so in those instances, sometimes if both are in play, we may address the carpal tunnel first because that's just an easier surgery to get over and then see if that's enough to kind of quiet things down uh, yeah. otherwise. So. Yeah. Well, I think I have to um, thank everyone for joining us, but I think we're going to have to invite everyone to join us again on a different day, and we'll do the ulnar nerve, which is your funny bone nerve. We didn't get it to it today. We didn't realize how much we got to talk about the carpal tunnel. So we'll set that up. We can do that. Um, but yeah, thank you all again from Washington University. Thank you for joining us today. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you.